title of this morning is Transformity. Dan and Angie, I'm assuming you're watching online this morning. And Dan, yes, I made up this word, but I found out it is a real word. Dan picks at me about making up my own words. So I, I, I was really just thinking about some things the other day. And, and, and I was, uh, I, of course, over the last couple of years, I've referenced the, the extremes within the church. And, and there's this old line extreme, this religious extreme. And then there's this hyper grace extreme. And I was thinking the other day, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're plagued by these two extremes. On one side, we have this hard line religion that tries to beat us into conformity to make us uh, look like something that, that religion says we're supposed to look like. And on the other side, we have this hyper grace that is such a rebellion to that or such an overcorrection that it tries to cover up our deformity. And in the middle, God is looking for our transformity. So then I was thinking, you know, transformity, that's a neat word. I thought, you know, Webster needs to call me so, so that I can let them know about this new word I created. <laughs> George W., I think, was the only one that was allowed to make up new words. So I looked it up just to see if it was a real word before I claimed credit. And it is in fact a word, but it's only been a word for about 25 years. So it's a new word. And it is the quality that transforms a power source into a tangible energy. Now I already had a message before I looked it up. And when I saw that, I was like, wow, that's good. It is the quality or the ratio in which energy can be transferred or transformed into energy. So it takes a, a power source like the sun. The sun does not produce energy in and of itself. It has a power source. And we have solar panels that absorb the power source. But it has to be transformed, which is transformity, into usable, tangible energy. That's good. So let me give you just several things kind of back to back and hopefully at the end I'll tie it all together. First off, Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. I apologize we don't have verses up. We have several people out this morning including my whole family except me. There's nothing wrong there on the road. I had to take Savannah to camp. Thank you, Becca. I'm going to give you credit for getting her there. So Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me read this to you out of the Passion Translation because I am in love with the Passion Translation. Yeah. Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God to be His sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights His heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but inwardly be transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. See, when it says be not conformed, but be you transformed, the word conformed means to beat into shape or to fashion after another. Transform means to recreate into something new. So he says don't be beat into shape by the world, but be transformed into a new creation by the renewing of your mind. I was thinking about this last night. I was like, because we always read that to be, don't be conformed. Don't try to look like the world. Don't try to be formed after the world's lust and desires. And that's part of it. But then I was thinking, you know, sometimes we hate something so bad that we're changed but because of our hatred for it. Maybe not even hatred. Maybe hatred is the wrong word. Maybe our despising of something. Do you despise drug abuse? 
Well, you can despise drug abuse so bad that you begin to despise the drug addict. You can despise perversion so bad that you despise the person bound by perversion. See, it's not just about being conformed in the way of the world, but sometimes it's being conformed against the world. So what happens is if we are so conformed to the world that we begin to look like the world, we lose our salt. But if we are so conformed against the world, we lose our light. But when we come in the middle and are transformed, we look at drug addiction and we hate it. We despise it. But we look at the drug addict and say, sweetheart, I love you. We look at, at the sin and say, I despise you, homosexuality. Oh, but homosexual. Son, you're a, you're a son of God. And he don't want you to stay this way. That's the difference between being conformed and transformed. Oh. See, we are in a process of being transformed. The word transformed is metamorpho. I know you're so impressed. I can feel your, 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 you're sitting there thinking, wow, his smarts are so good. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that. I took Hebrew. I didn't take Greek. This is a Greek word from where we get more metamorphosis. It's, it's either metamorpho or metamorpho. <laughs> That's how smart I am. <laughs> but you know what the good thing is? <laughs> You're as smart as I am, so you don't know the difference. We went to India when, back in 2008, and, 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 and I was going to be ministering to certain groups, and, and I asked Glenn, I said, well, man, what if I mess up? He said, don't worry, they won't know the difference. <laughs> they can't speak English anyway. <laughs> So metamorpho, this, this word occurs four times in Scripture. I think you're going to like this. The first time that it occurs, or, or one time that it occurs, is Romans 12, uh, verse 2, to be transformed. The second time, or the next, is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And it says, but we all... With open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. Let me give this to you in the Passion. We, are, we can all draw close to Him with the veil removed from our faces, and with no veil we all become like mirrors, who brightly reflect the glory of Jesus Christ. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to the next. And the, this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So what, what Paul says here is as we are in the glory of God, we become mirrors to reflect his image. Because remember, we are created in his likeness and in his image. So we're created in his image, but we don't always display his image. But we've been in his glory. We become like a mirror and we are metamorphosed to reflect his image. Oh, that's so good. So Paul says in Romans, he says, don't be conformed by the world, but be metamorphosed by the word of God. And then he says, when we get into his glory, when we get into his presence, we're like a mirror that reflects. We are metamorphosed to reflect his glory. Oh, the other two times that that verse appears is when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration. So four times that word occurs in the New Testament. And two times it's talking about Jesus being transfigured. And the other two is talking about us being transfigured. That's so good. I actually want to talk to you this morning about affliction. <laughs> Oppression. Difficulties. There are times and seasons where some things just don't go right, right? And there's other seasons where everything goes wrong. I'm not going to tell you what season this is. (laughs) 
let's just say it's been fun. I used to have a friend that says, man, it's been real and it's been fun, but it has not been real fun. I think we can say that about this season. See, God is transforming us into a new creation. But sometimes being transformed is not easy. When a caterpillar is transformed to a butterfly, the caterpillar has to die so the butterfly can live. Ron Lestrange once said, before we can receive a new mantle, sometimes we have to be dismantled. So let me ask you, do you feel like in this past season, over the last several months, that you have been being dismantled? See, I have a, a great uh, uh, a vision, an image of this, because we had a large tree fall on my mother's shop, and it's a very large shop, and, and so I'm having to dismantle, <laughs> no anger in that, what is left. I'm also trying to get stuff out before it collapses on me. <laughs> The insurance guy called the other day and he said, well, where are you on the, on the process? And I said, look, when I'm in there, every time I go in there, it drops about a foot from the last time I was in there. So I'm a little nervous that one day I'm going to go in. One came in and none came out. I don't want to be that story. He said, look, when I looked at it, I was scared to be in there, so I understand. Take your time. But I understand this process of, of tearing something apart before we can rebuild something new. And this past season has been a season of transformity. Here's what that verse means with transformity. It is our ability to transform the power of the Holy Spirit into a tangible power in our life. See, the non-believer doesn't have access to the power source, nor do they have the ability of transformity to make it into something tangible. So Paul was saying, in that hard season, in your affliction, be the one that's not conformed to the world. But be the one that understands he can hook up to the power source and transform it into a tangible power. That's why we're being transformed. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that is transforming us into a new creation because God has us going into a new season and the new season is a season that the old man can't stand up to. An old wineskin can't hold new wine. So let me give you a couple of verses real quick. I've printed them out so they're larger. <laughs> Miss Nidra was, had taken some notes from something, a, a message she heard she was trying to show me this morning, and she handed me a piece of paper, and I'm so impressed that she can write so small. And I was looking, I was like, <laughs> I was doing that whole, you know, get it in focus. And she said, you mean write that where you can see it? I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> So James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, 4, 12, 13, 14, 15. You remember all that, right? <laughs> It'll sound really familiar. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or tribulations or struggles or problems or frustrations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience and everybody said oh lord amen <laughs> and let patience have her perfect work now i'm not even going to ask why james gave it a feminine name there i'm gonna leave that alone because i want to walk out whole this morning <laughs> that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing and then in verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, or endureth the hard season. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. And when that lust conceives, it brings forth sin. And when sin 
is finished, it brings death. So what James is saying is don't blame your hard times on God. But embrace those hard times because God is going to use them to work in you. A perfected work. Do you want to be perfect? None of y'all said anything. Nobody wants to be perfect. Let me rephrase this. Would you like to have the perfect bank account? Would you like to have the perfect body? Would you like to have the perfect intelligence? When we get to heaven, it's all going to be there. (laughs) But God allows us to go through afflictions because it is perfecting a work inside of us. I'll tell you something. There is a perfect version of you over here. Y'all are so quiet. Let me say it this way. There's a perfect version for me. There's a perfect version over here of me. Except he's still not six foot one. I don't know what's happening there. But it's over there. And I can see it. And when I pray, I say, God, I want to be that man. I want to be that spiritual man that I see. I want to be that emotional man and that physical man and that that financial man and that all that right there. I want to be that man right there. But God, there's a shell over me keeping me from that. And the Lord says, I'm breaking you out because that's where I'm taking you. Well, how do we get there? It's a process to get there. And the process is affliction. Persecution. (laughs) Y'all so excited. I talk about shame being removed and everybody's like, whoo, I talk about affliction. (laughs) I'm the same way. But I want to learn it quick. (laughs) I want to learn as quick as I can. I want to have the accelerated reader version. Because I don't want to stay in the affliction any longer than I have to. If you want to stay there, I'll come visit you and pray for you from a distance. (laughs) Psalms. And I'll give you, I'll give you the verses I'm going to read. (laughs) There's no point in even trying these. (laughs) Psalms 119, verses 67, 71, 72, 92, 75. (laughs) You're welcome. For those of you taking notes, I can give you those afterwards, or you can read the entire Psalm of 119 because it is absolutely wonderful. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn of your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that in your faithfulness you have afflicted me. Now, this is not David. David blaming everything on God. He's saying, you've allowed me to be afflicted. Let me just paraphrase the heart of David in this to the best that I can. David, later in his life, he looks and he says, God, thank you so much for allowing me to be afflicted. Because if I had been allowed to grow comfortable where I was, I was veering off path and I would have continued to veer off path. But God, you allowed me to endure affliction. And in my afflictions, when I was running from Absalom, when I was running from Saul, when I was defending myself against Shemil, when I thought all was lost, I had no place to go but your presence. I had no place to go but your word. He actually says that I was made a lover of your law. That's not just the word of God. That's the commandments of God. This was serious. He didn't just say, God, I fell in love with your blessings. Oh, I fell in love with your good stories of victory. He said, I fell in love with your commandments. Because David understood the commandments of God brought forth a commanded blessing. And in the commanded blessing, he was fruitful. So he said, God, I understand. I could never be fruitful in my life had it not been for the affliction driving me to your word. When I got into your word, I fell in love with your law. And your law produces fruit. 
Oh my goodness. See, when trials and tribulations come, it works in us a perfect work. Let me put it in, in, in better terms. When I was a teenager, I would watch some people come through the church. And they would come through and, and they would get on fire for God. Man, they were, uh, they were just declaring the glory of the Lord and ready to lead revival around, uh, uh, around the nation. You know, they were just on fire. And then after about three, four months, they'd leave the church. And I'd be like, Dad, where did they go? And he said, well, they'll be back. It's okay. And I would just think, okay. <laughs> And about six months later, maybe a year later, they'd come back to the church and they'd be just broken, lives in shambles, marriage about to fall apart, finances just uh, in, in complete disarray, back hooked on whatever, and they'd come in the church just broken. And they would get back in the glory of God and they'd get all patched up and, and they're declaring revival again. I'd be like, yes, God's doing something in their life. And then when everything got right, they'd leave again. And I'd be like, Dad. And he said, don't worry, they'll be back. <laughs> After a while, I stopped asking. I could look at a calendar and go, well, so-and-so should be back. <laughs> it's about that season. <laughs> Why? Because when things get bad, the affliction pushes us to the house of God. But when things get okay, we lose that desperation. So what about the faithful, committed believers? What about you people who are here every week? We do something similar. See, we, we press into the Lord at times because we're just hungry for God. And then we get a little lax at times just because life gets busy. And then bad things begin to happen. What do you do when bad things first start to happen? Oh, some of you more religious, you're like, well, I press into the Lord. When I get that bill that I wasn't expected, I say, oh, you are my provider. When I get that diagnosis that was not planned, I say, oh, God, do you have healed me? Well, great for you. The rest of us, when something first happens, we actually pull back further because we get knocked off balance a little bit. And all of a sudden, our daily reading is not quite as intense as it was the day before. And our prayer time is more of a whining time than it is a prayer time. We're no longer interceding. Now we're, oh God, I just can't believe this happened. God, I don't deserve this. You've never said that, right? Well, thank God we don't get what we deserve. <laughs> so, so we begin to pull back further. Now, some of you are looking at me like, others are looking at me like, I'm not going to nod, I'm not going to admit to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what the faithful do. We get hit, we get knocked off balance, and we get, begin to push back. And then as men, I don't know about you ladies, I'm, I'm kidding, I do know about you ladies. We try to fix the problem. Men try to fix the problem. Women try to get the man to fix the problem. So women try to fix the man to fix the problem. <laughs> I still have not figured out Solomon. All them wives, I'm thinking, dude. <laughs> and you're the wisest man? <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm going to leave that all alone. I can say that. My wife is driving this morning. So if she is watching online, she can't do anything. So, so what we do is we begin to try to fix the problem. We begin to react in the flesh. Yeah, I don't do that. I do that. And then all of a sudden we begin to fight this and fight this. And when it's a spiritual battle, the flesh can't win against the spirit. So we push and we push and we push and we push. I got to look back before I fall. We push. And then we give up. Oh, thank God for the give up. Some of us are more stubborn than others. Right? I'm stubborn. I've always been little, but I've always been stout, and I've always had little man syndrome, just a tad bit. Mark's had it more than me, but I had a little bit. <laughs> I'm stubborn. 
I don't like to admit defeat. I'm the guy that in a wrestling match, if they pin and you're, you're wanting to tap out, I'm probably going to pass out before I tap out just because I'm not going to admit defeat. <laughs> so we get into this struggle with the Lord and then we give up. And when we give up, we're being transformed. God is bringing us to a place that we're giving up our will. We're giving up our fight. We're not giving up on victory because what happens when we get to a place, let me tell you where we get of desperation. We get to this place and we say, God, I can't take this anymore. And then we throw our hands up. God doesn't want us to throw our hands up. This is not about defeat. This is not about accepting defeat. But we get to a place and we say, God, I just can't take anymore. I give up. But then the enemy comes in with five more things right after we give up. Because we think in our head if we give up, then the fight stops. No, it don't, fight. It don't stop. The, the fight continues. So the enemy comes in with five more things. So then we get mad. It's okay to get angry. Scripture says be angry and sin not. But Jesus is the one that walked into the temple. And when they made a mockery of the temple, he grabbed some whips and drove them out. We need to grab some whips and drive the enemy out. We got to get to a place that we give up and the enemy keeps pushing so that we get to a place that we say no more. Patrick Henry, one of our founding fathers, when, when they were uh, debating in 1775, they were debating on whether or not to break away from England. And they had this delegation in Virginia, and, and they were uh, uh, arguing back and forth. And Thomas Jefferson was there, and, and, and George Washington was there. And they were arguing, should we break away? And they were saying, but if we do, it's treason, and off with our heads. And then Patrick Henry gets up, and he gives this long speech on how we have to do this. And then he ends it by saying, give me liberty, or give me death. And then the crowd was silent. And then they sign the papers. Do you know? We see we, we clout that. We say, give me liberty or give me death. Oh, Patrick Henry was so passionate and so moved. That man was desperate. It wasn't about passion. It was about desperation. He said, I can't live anymore like this. He said, if it's not going to change, kill me. See, when we think of it 200 years later, we think it's this great thing. No, he was so desperate. God allows us to get so desperate in our lives that we stop and we say, God, I can't take this anymore. I can't take my children going that direction anymore. I can't take my life going like this anymore. God, I have to have you. So we leave the place of wanting God. And we go to a place of needing God. And we leave the place of needing God to a place of having to have Him. We're at the place where God is moving us to having to have Him. This is where we are not conformed of the world. But we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Because in his affliction, just like David, we are pushed back into his law. Not just his word. See, this is where the church is so off. See, the, 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 the uh, religious side tries to bend us and break us into a place of looking like the church. And the hyper grace side over here tries to cover everything up so that we don't look like anything or everything. Both are bound by a religious spirit. Because the religious spirit says you have to make... Your, the religious spirit is rooted in pride. We all understand that, correct? It's rooted in pride of you got to look like me. So the religious says if you don't wear a suit and tie and have your hair cut a certain way and not have any markings on your body and so forth and so on, then you can't be of God. And then the hyper grace over here says if you don't have the, the markings on the body and you don't wear skinny jeans that are all ripped up and all this, then you are of the religious. Well, they're just as religious because they're saying you got to look like us. So, they, so the hyper grace looks at me in a, in, a, in a suit and says, oh, you are religious. And then the religious looks at me and says, oh, young man, 
You are, are fulfilling the call of God. And that's on Sunday, on Monday, when I have on my T-shirt, they look at, oh. Because it's not about what you wear. It's not about how you look. It's about how your heart looks toward God. However, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So if we love God, we're not going to be drawn by the world. When the world pushes us in a certain way, we don't want to look like the world. And we don't want to look like the church. We want to look like God. Because we want to reflect His glory as in a mirror. As we move from one level of brightness to the next. Is that good or what? I'm about to close. I think, maybe. I'm debating on closing. We're going to take a vote in a few minutes on whether I should close or not. That was such a joke. <laughs> I've been on these boards where I was on one board and then we were trying to write a letter. And so we we're going to take a, a vote on who should write the letter. So there was eight members on the board. So out of eight members, there were seven suggestions. And the reason I say seven is because I didn't even give a suggestion. While they were all debating on who should write a letter, I sat there writing a letter. And then the president of the board said, well, let's vote because we have all these different names. And well, they can't make an agreement because you have seven. <laughs> so I just pinned this letter out real quick because it was not hard. And I scooted across the table to him. And without saying anything, he just looks and he reads it. Well, I'll make a motion that we just approve this letter. I'm on some other boards that are so much easier because we have the same vision and the same heart and we're just wanting to move forward and, and that's great. I gave you all that just to tell you that I'm not taking a vote on whether I should close. So, <laughs> but, I, but I am, I am about to close. Let me give you a couple meanings to the word breaking. The, at the first of the year, the Lord gave me several prophetic words about the year. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember that. Um, but there were, were five specific words that the Lord gave me. And of these words, it was, uh, I'm coming into the promise. God explodes. I'm giving you the editing tools to rewrite your future. And the last two, which were actually the first two, fresh start, clean slate, new beginnings. And I'm breaking you out of the old and into the new. So over the last several weeks, I've been hearing that word breaking and breaking and breaking. And you know, we know what the word breaking means. <laughs> and it's not always a good connotation. But I have seen myself and, I, and I've been praying. I'm like, God, I know where I want to go. And I'm not there. And, it, and we don't need to ever really get where we want to go. We need to keep moving that marker a little bit. I mean, I have set goals in, in most things that I do. So I go to the gym and I have set goals and I reached a new goal the other day and I was so happy. I hit a new max on my bench press and I was like, yes. And then I, I, was, I follow a guy on, on, on Instagram as, as an NFL guy and he was lifting the same weight that I lifted and I was like, yes. But I struggled it out. I was like. <laughs> and I got it. It took me a minute. And I watch him and he says, I'm about to lift this weight. And I'm like. That's the weight I, weight I lift. <laughs> Except he did it 20 times. <laughs> the first 17 were like this. And I was like, I now have me a new goal. To do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> See, we set a goal and we move it further down the line. Because I don't want to ever reach a place that I'm, I'm satisfied. I want to be happy where I'm at. But I don't want to be satisfied with staying there. See, God's moving us into a place that we're so dissatisfied and discontented that we're going to fight to get out of here. So real quick, definitions for the word breaking according to the different Hebrew words for breaking. Frustration. In Ezra, where it says they came in and frustrated the purpose, the word is the same as breaking. 
Frustration. I know y'all haven't dealt with frustration. That's just me. I'm just... Have you ever been driving through traffic and whatever lane you pick is going to be the slow lane? It don't matter which one it is. I love these red lights by OCS because they don't actually turn red on the highway unless somebody pulls up to turn. So I can go there. It doesn't matter if it's 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock at night, or 3 o'clock in the morning. Somebody is going to pull up just before I get there so it turns red. Just saying. I was on my way to the hospital one night at 1 o'clock in the morning. And I come to, and it turned, anyway, I'm a, Lord, I release that to you. <laughs> it means affliction. It means to birth. It means to break forth or to bloom. It means to ascend or to mount up. See, I don't separate these words because God allows us to go through affliction and frustration because it's breaking off of us what needs to be broken off because we are coming into a place that we are birthing something new and we are breaking forth. We are blooming and we are mounting up. Oh, that's so good. Ladies, if y'all will go ahead and come to the instruments. Let me give you Two, two last things. I have a lot more notes than that, but I'm going I'm to leave you alone. In Genesis chapter 32, we have Jacob who wrestles with an angel. I love this story. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go into a second sermon, even though I could with this story, because I love the story. Jacob comes to this place and, and he's about to meet Esau and, and he's a, a, about to, in his mind, be killed by Esau for uh, being dishonest in the way that he received the blessing. So he comes to this place and he sends everybody away from him and an angel comes up and he begins to wrestle with the angel. And he wrestles all night long and when the, the sunlight came up, the angel took his finger and he poked him in the hip and it threw everything out of whack and he lost his strength. Now, what is so amazing to me about that story is the angel, which I believe to be Jesus. You can, uh, 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 that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day, but I believe it was Jesus wrestling with him. And at the breaking of day, he just popped him in the hip. Now, he could have done that at any point in time. The moment they started, the angel could have grabbed him and just crushed him. But he didn't. He could have knocked his hip out just to prevent the fight, but he didn't. He wrestled with him all night long. And then he touched him in his strength. And Jacob still wouldn't let go. And the angel said, let me go. Now the angel could have grabbed him and thrown him off. It wasn't like the angel couldn't get away. Oh, let me go. No, 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 no. And this angel was so powerful. He was like, I can destroy you. And one little swipe. He wanted to struggle with him. The angel wanted to struggle with Jacob because he was breaking Jacob. Because he could not recreate Israel until Jacob was broken. Jacob means deceiver or supplanter or heel catcher. But his mother already knew that he was supposed to be the one that was blessed. Because when Jacob and Esau were in the womb, God told Rebekah, she said, why is there a war going on inside of me? And he said, because you have two nations and the older will serve the younger, which was Jacob. So his whole life, she took him and she said, you're the one that God has said is blessed. But his name was Jacob. To be done by the flesh. So Rebecca took him and she says, I don't know exactly how we need to do this, but I know that God has called you to be the one to receive the blessing. So this is what we're going to do. And she devises a plan and he goes along with the plan. And everything in Jacob's life up to the point that he wrestled with the angel was done by the arm of the flesh. And when he would not let go, the angel said, no longer will you be called Jacob. He actually asked him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob, what is your identity? And he said, by the flesh. And he said, no longer will you be called Yaakov. You will be called Yisrael. No longer will you be called one who does it by the flesh. But now you're going to be called God prevails. See, it's in the breaking that we release our abilities. 
and we receive his abilities. It's in the breaking that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind where we take the real power source and transform it into tangible energy. Oh, that's so good. Y'all go ahead and stand. The greatest power in our lives right now is the affliction that we face. It's that frustration that plagues us. It's that lack that confines us. It's the struggle that, that, that binds us. That's the greatest force in our life right now because it's moving us into the presence of God and into the arms of God. It's moving us to a place that we receive a greater power 